So what does it take to start building a uh, product line architecture? Well, like most things, a little forethought and planning will go a long way. Um, this, uh, this question has been contemplated uh, not only for product line architectures, but also um, when object-oriented programming first started, people were starting to look at, oh, okay, now we, have, um, now we have the capability of reuse. And so we ought to think about what kind of things we need to do to make these objects we are developing reusable. Now, the same kind of thing goes for uh, product line architectures. What do you have to do to make the architecture more general and more potentially reusable by other uh, products, uh, related products in this particular product line? Now, it's best if there's some demonstrable need for um, multiple versions of this thing. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't pay to, to try and develop a product line architecture if you're ever only going to build about two of them, because you start getting the returns back on about number three. Now it is true that a product line architecture uh, is a shift about as much as going from um, tailor-made products to factory-made products. Not entirely, but it's a, it's a good analogy to think of because it's not, not just that you're building the one architecture, but you're building the architecture and the means of producing lots of architects or lots of products. So you're having to build both the product and the means of production. So with the production and product and production process, um, the individual products can be built differently each time. They can really be built uh, tailor-made for the customer. Whereas if you're building a product line, you can get most of what the customer wants but possibly not all the customer wants. But in return for a much lower uh, price, much lower cost, and a much uh, faster um, time to deliver. A, you have to have this consistent development method, uh, or the, the method that produces consistency. And that uh, reduces flexibility and responsiveness, obviously. Uh, but with increased um, increased quality and uh, reduced time to de develop. Now for architecture for product lines, of all the assets in the asset repository, the architecture is probably uh, the most valuable. It's certainly the one with the most consequence, um, simply because it's probably about the first thing, um, the first thing that gets developed that then has quite a significant effect on the kind of product that you're going to build. So it's a, probably a very uh, central element and uh, very expensive. The essence of building a successful product line is discriminating between what's expected to remain constant and what's expected to vary. Now, you might think that's a fairly obvious statement. It, it may be. Product line architecture concerns itself with a set of explicitly allowed variations. And obviously the, the um, opposite of that is um, explicitly disallowed variations. So some things must remain constant and some things do, do vary. So product lines uh, architectures do need to consider three things. To identify the variation points, to support the variation points, and to evaluate the product line architecture for its suitability. How do you get started? Well, you could do a lot worse than to start with the business process and try and understand that. Um, similar, similar businesses. I mean, if you're going to produce a lot of products, what, what's going to be common across the customers? So let's have a look at the, the, uh, the business processes across a number of potential customers. For example, there has been published a supply chain operations reference model, the SCORE model. And it starts with a very, very basic high-level uh, categorization of um, source, make, deliver, and return. All right, so source, try to find um, who can do what you want. Make, get it made, and deliver, deliver it from the, the um, maker to the consumer, and return, return it. Um, presumably if it's uh, end of its life or it's uh, defective or something of that nature. Now the entirety of the SCORE model is a recursive breakdown and decomposition of that particular 
um, breakup. Now, this is a university, so we have some very similar things. Same with every other university. Uh, when it comes to students, students go through their life cycle. We have to enroll them, we have to uh, assess them, we have to graduate them. Um, course management, if you're talking about the uh, degree within a, a, a university, we have to um, uh, plan that, um, develop the uh, courses, we have to uh, develop subjects within the courses, and we have to teach those subjects within the courses. In general commerce, we can have uh, client management systems, and they have common characteristics. We can have um, event management systems where you essentially schedule and plan the event. You recruit participants to the event and then you actually hold the event. So, uh, a similar model. Industry management systems, you have uh, acquire, maintain, dispose, lend, return. You have very similar uh, processes. So, the, the whole idea there is that uh, with product lines, try and identify the common business processes or common processes across the potential market for it. When it comes to identifying variation points, um, have a look at how does one organization differ from another. Are they different uh, in um, technology, the scale of them, the peripheral components, uh, performance requirements, uh, languages and other user interface features. Right, so usually you have one. The things that are pretty hard to change are things like the workflow because that's embedded across so much of the architecture. Is the, the workflow is actually pretty much implemented in the architecture and it would be very difficult to change that without changing the fundamental architecture. Interfaces and infrastructure. Um, the interfaces do tend to be somewhat um, fixed within the architecture uh, because we're talking about the interface between architectural components, not the user interface. Uh, limits, whether they're anticipated or not. Um, most architectures do run out of steam when the limits are reached. Supporting the variation points, um, there are three major tactics for doing this. Uh, first one is parameterization, so you can put up uh, some, some particular variations and just have a parameter to tune it. You can have information hiding and inheritance. Now they are the three main ones that are used to uh, implement variation points. Now what makes software product lines are difficult. If you're, if you're setting out to, to develop a product line and you haven't done it before, what's going to get in your way? Well, there's a certain amount of resistance to adopting a product line uh, approach within the organization. Um, now that, um, I'll deal with that and more about that in a minute. Support tools like configuration management systems uh, do need to handle the uh, increased complexity and it's difficult to convince the customers they can't have everything they want uh, if they're accustomed to dealing with one organization and you know as a as a sole supplier they expect that you'd be able to do everything that they want and when they want it but with a product line um, it, now you're dealing with um, things that pretty much every customer must need before you can implement it or it has to be part of the um, the individualization uh, of the product for different customers. Now product lines do evolve. Right? Um, it would be um, sad to think that uh, once, you've, once you've set out the product line, once you've designed the product line, that's it. It, it never changes from there. They do evolve and uh, possibly your architecture does need to anticipate that they will evolve. Core assets must evolve if possible because we learn how to do it better as time goes on. Evolution must be controlled to avoid feature bloat, mismatch components and blind alleys. Right, that's something you do. Customers do learn the system and, and absorb the lessons of the system. When any new system or capability uh, is first released, uh, it usually provides um, capabilities that people are not accustomed to or customers haven't got. But it doesn't take long before they get that in, in place and they learn that, they absorb that, and that becomes the new normal. And now we're starting to look for new features. So you're going to get feature requests that come out. Eventually, the system will encounter, encounter its architectural limits. And these can be things like database size. Um, now, in my experience, the, the limits come about with, um, usually from 
fairly not seemingly trivial decisions that were uh, not considered important at the time, like the size of a variable or uh, the number of um, the number of digits in a customer number, for example. It's one of the things that usually trips people up. Now, the mindset for product lines, um, the lessons from people who've done it before, the whole uh, trick to it is mastering abstraction. Successful product line developers are concerned about developing the product line. Unsuccessful product line developers are more concerned about developing lots of products. All right? There's a difference between the two. So successful product line developers are conscious that this is a product line and they concentrate on the things that make this common and useful across all potential customers. Whereas unsuccessful product line developers kind of play lip service to that, but try to get all the features that each customer wants. Successful product line developers learn to use abstracted features of the product line to develop new but related businesses. I'll see more of that later. So in summary, how to go about de developing a product line architecture, you start with the business processes. Determine actual and possible variations in the business processes. Variations are uh, supported by the three different areas. The, you have the parameterization, you have information hiding, and you have inheritance. Now, information hiding and inheritance allows you to implement a, a, a different a, a variation for each customer. You can just plug out one object and plug another one in. Architecture evaluation does become more demanding because you are having to evaluate uh, not only for this architecture and this customer, but potentially all customers, the architecture across all customers. So that becomes a little bit more difficult, just as this is uh, difficult, more difficult to design in the first place. Product lines must be managed to avoid uh, chaos of feature bloat, mismatched components and blind alleys. Uh, that's true, all right? So you, you must, I mean, it's hard enough to try and uh, design a product line architecture in the first place, um, but even so, you really ought to consider the possible evolution of the architecture as well as changing technology.